Hey everybody. Uh, the video we're about to watch is a very lengthy one and after I shot it yesterday I sat down and I watched it and I'm not 100% satisfied with my explanation of osmo regulation at the end. So rather than reshoot this whole video or even reshoot that segment I decided I would simply do an intro video, uh, say hello to you all, show you my face behind the voice and explain that when I mean layman's lectures, or when I say layman's lectures, I'm not thinking about me lecturing to the layman. I'm thinking about myself as the layman lecturing to you. So go forward knowing that everything that I'm saying was just off the top of my head and is not in any way intended to be the definitive end-all discussion of osmoregulation and how all this stuff works. I'm not 100% satisfied with my explanation of the osmoregulation that we'll get into at the latter part of this video, but I'm not dissatisfied with it either. It's accurate enough that it gets my point across and it will put you very firmly in the right direction of doing any further research on your own if you're interested in finding out more details about how all this stuff works. The goal of this video is simply to leave the viewer at the other end with a better understanding of why water hardness is so important in your aquarium and how it really does impact your fish. Uh, when you see on the label it says water hardness of this or water hardness of that, you really need to take that seriously and hopefully by the end of this video you'll have a little better understanding of why you need to take that seriously. And if there's any questions, any comments, anything, feel free to leave them below. Anybody that knows more about this than me, by all means feel free to correct me or put your annotations in the comment section below. So keeping all that in mind, please go forward knowing that this is not the definitive word on osmoregulation, but it is simply this layman's understanding of it to the best of my ability off the top of my head. So without further ado, please enjoy. Hey everybody. Uh, today I want to talk about water hardness. I've been asked to do a video about this and I've been talking about doing it for a while. Um, so today I want to get into it and I want to talk about it in a lot more depth and discussion. I want to talk about water hardness, I want to talk about the various kinds of water hardness, and most importantly I want to talk about how water hardness affects your fish and why it's so important in our aquariums. Uh, a lot of you have probably heard me use the term osmoregulation uh, on many occasions, and water hardness is directly related to osmoregulation and how well your fish are able to do that. So I will uh, eventually, once we sort of clarify what water hardness is and how all that works, we will move into osmoregulation and why this water hardness is so important. So the first thing I want to do is sort of make sure we're all on the same page. I've debated about how to go about doing this and I've decided I think the best way to do it, even though it kind of seems backwards, I want to talk about the various other sorts of hardnesses before we get into general hardness, which is what I'm going to be talking about and which is what we generally concern ourselves with when we talk about water hardness in our aquarium. But there's a lot of different kinds of things that are considered water hardness in your aquarium. There is general hardness, which we will leave for last. Um, there is temporary hardness, there is permanent hardness, and there is carbonate hardness. So the difference between temporary hardness and permanent hardness is simply a matter of whether or not um, boiling the water would remove them. So I believe it is calcium hydrocarbonates or hydrogen carbonates um, and magnesium hydrogen carbonates will actually break down and uh, leave the water if you boil it. So that is not considered a permanent hardness. Permanent hardness will not leave the water when you boil it. And when we get into talking about the aquarium industry or the aquarium hobby, these terms sort of almost start to take on a slightly different um, meaning as well. Uh, for example, nitrates are considered permanent hardness in your tank because they account for total dissolved solids that will not get out of the water by boiling it. Um, your carbonate hardness will leave the water when you boil it. If you boil your water and you've got 10 degrees carbonate hardness, you will have none after you've boiled your water for a little bit. Now I know we're not going to boil the water in our fish tanks, but it's the difference between temporary hardness and permanent hardness. Not particularly relevant for this conversation, but I do just want to get these terms out there in case you've heard any of them and you're wondering, you know, am I talking about this kind of hardness or that kind of hardness or whatever. So let's just sort of think about the temporary and permanent hardness as being something altogether sort of different. It don't really matter for this conversation. Carbonate hardness is a little closer to 
being relevant for what we're going to talk about. Carbonate hardness is just another way of expressing the amount of buffering capacity you have in your tank. You could also refer to your carbonate hardness as your tank's alkalinity. Now a lot of times we don't like to use the term alkalinity and we will use the term carbonate hardness because if you use the term alkalinity that starts getting you confused with having alkaline water and alkaline water or basic water you know on the pH scale higher than seven is considered an alkaline condition that is not the same as your tanks alkalinity your tanks alkalinity is its buffering capacity and that again can be expressed as carbonate hardness and that's generally why it's expressed as carbonate hardness just so you don't get that sort of confusion when you talk about your tank's alkalinity because your tank can have a fair amount of alkalinity but not necessarily have a very high pH. Again, the, the alkaline condition is not the same as your tank's alkalinity or carbonate hardness. So all of those things aside, what we're going to be talking about today is going to be general hardness. A general hardness is pretty easy to explain but it can get a little confusing because there's numbers out there that you'll see if you do any research online you'll start pretty quickly finding these numbers that make you scratch your head um, they're just too vague and too random um, general hardness is nothing more than the measurement of calcium and magnesium that are in your water now, a little bit of iron and a few other trace minerals probably uh, are in there somewhere, but for the vast majority of what we're talking about, it's going to be the amount of calcium and magnesium you have in your water. That's what your water hardness is. When you run it through a water softener, it, that's what it's removing. When people talk about having hard water versus soft water in your aquarium, that's what they're talking about. They're not talking about other dissolved solids at all. They're talking about how much calcium and magnesium do you have in your water. Um, when people add all of the hardness to their water for their African cichlids, they're adding magnesium sulfate and usually calcium carbonate or calcium bicarbonate. So again, they're just putting the calcium and the magnesium in the water. That's the important part of general hardness. But sometimes you will look up uh, water hardness and you'll say, okay, um, if you look into total dissolved solids, and I've done videos on total dissolved solids, I don't know why that, that they get confusing, but they really get confusing. Um, I think they get confusing because people try to put too specific of an importance on any given number, and without knowing exactly what all those dissolved solids are, the number is fairly insignificant. It just gives you an idea that you got a lot or a little of something there, but it doesn't tell you what those somethings are. So when you look um, you know, it's some sort of general guideline. They'll say maybe zero to 70 parts per million is fairly soft water, and 70 parts per million to 150 parts per million is moderately soft, and you know, so on and so forth. Well, that's fine, but that's only fine if you're talking about calcium and magnesium. If you live somewhere where you've got a lot of silicates in your water and you've got a lot of sulfur in your water, you might not have any calcium or magnesium at all. So your water is going to measure very soft when you actually do a general hardness test. Yet if you stuck a TDS meter, you might have three or four hundred parts per million, but still have very soft water. And that's the conditions I have in my tank. I don't have any calcium or magnesium in my water, but I do have sodium ions in my water. So my TDS usually comes out between 200 and 250, depending on the tank. And again, with the TDS, that's talking about nitrates, phosphates, anything at all that's dissolved into my water shows up as a total dissolved solid. That does sort of encompass this permanent hardness when you get into aquarium speak, but it's not general hardness in the terms of water hardness, whether you need to get a water softener or whether you have hard water fish or soft water fish. Every time you hear that kind of terminology used when you're talking about a hard water tank or a soft water tank or hard water fish, or that is talking about the amount of calcium and the amount of magnesium you've got in your water. And that's pretty much it. So moving forward, as we talk about water hardness, that's what we're going to be thinking about. We're not going to be thinking about nitrates or any other of these dissolved solids unless I specifically address them because I probably will at some point. But from here on forward, we're not going to be talking about the carbonate hardness or all these other various forms of, carb of, of hardness you might have heard of. We're simply going to be talking about 
general hardness in terms of calcium and magnesium because calcium and magnesium are also electrolytes and your animals need certain amounts of these for their nervous systems to work properly and so on and so forth but we're not going to get into that too much today we're going to get more into the osmoregulation what osmoregulation is how all that works and why this is important to your fish so sit tight we're going to go look at another tank for a second and the discussion will continue all right to understand osmoregulation we need to first understand um, what osmosis is and to understand what osmosis is we need to understand what diffusion is so we're going to start from diffusion and we're going to work our way up um, diffusion is very simply the tendency for a higher concentration of dissolved solids to move into an area of lower concentration of dissolved solids in other words it wants to spread out uh, if you think about um, some rock salt, if you put a little pile of rock salt at the bottom of a tank of water and you just let it sit there with no water circulation at all, eventually as that salt dissolved into the water, those salt molecules would have a tendency to push away from each other and eventually you would come to a state where it was evenly spread out throughout the water until of course you reach saturation point and that's something completely different. But the idea of the salt wanting to spread out and evenly disperse itself throughout the water. That's diffusion. That's all that diffusion is. It's no more complicated than that. So when we get into osmosis, it gets a little bit different and we'll save how this actually works in the animals for a moment. Let's just talk about the actual process of osmosis uh, before we get into osmoregulation. Osmosis is the process by which water tries to come to this evenly dispersed state but it has to do through do so through a semi-permeable membrane and that's important because let's say we've now divided this tank down the middle and we have a semi-permeable membrane that dissolved solids cannot pass through but water can or water may be attached to certain molecules can but other molecules can't we've got a really limited amount of movement that can go through this semi-permeable membrane for the most part it's going to be water only so let's say on the left side we put salt water and on the right side we put fresh water in the process of diffusion which is what would naturally happen that salt would eventually evenly spread out throughout the water. Well now it can't because there's this membrane in the way. So what has to happen is the water now from the fresh side, the lower density or the hypotonic side, now has to move through this membrane into the hypertonic side until they achieve a state of isotonic where they're both the same amount of dissolved solids on either side of the membrane. So diffusion is where the dissolved solids want to move through the water and spread out. Osmosis is where the same end result is achieved, but it's through this semi-permeable membrane, and it's the water that has to move to balance out the amounts of dissolved solids. And that's very important because a cell is a semi-permeable membrane that allows water and certain dissolved solids through, but not other dissolved solids. So now it's beginning to make a little more sense why the amount of dissolved calcium and magnesium you have in your water and how fast or slow that can and how easily it can move through a semi-permeable membrane now starts to really affect the biology of what's going on in your fish. So next we're going to actually start talking about osmoregulation and how osmoregulation is what keeps your fish alive and why it's so important. So sit tight and we will move on and look at another tank. All right, what is osmoregulation? Osmoregulation is the active process by which an animal maintains the internal osmotic pressure within its cells against whatever the external amount of dissolved solids in any given body of water is. Now, human beings do the same thing. Uh, we drink our water rather than live in it. 
but we still drink our water and we still have to be careful about the amount of dissolved solids in our water, the amounts of salts we consume, uh, etc. You probably don't realize it, but your bones actually store mineral salts, and if you're not getting enough of it in your water and you are getting uh, deficiency, your body will actually start feeding dissolved solids back into yourself via your bones. There's a lot of things a body will do to maintain the homeostasis uh, or the favorable condition that it needs to be in uh, to function properly. So with fish there's two different types of ways to maintain your osmotic pressure. Um, there is osmoconformers and then there's osmoregulators. Osmoconformers are usually marine inverts, things like corals. Um, osmoconformers are not the norm and we're not really going to talk about them, but osmoconformers can't actively adjust. They're pretty much susceptible to whatever their external salinity is. So if you change that external salinity even by just a little bit, they can't deal with it. They don't have any mechanism to adjust for that the way osmoregulators do. So osmoconformers are usually very, very sensitive to even slight changes in salinity. Anybody that keeps corals can probably attest to exactly what I'm saying. That's exactly why. They're osmoconformers. They're not osmoregulators. Osmoregulators are far more common. We're osmoregulators. Birds are osmoregulators. Fish are osmoregulators. Um, within the group of osmoregulators, you have two different types of osmoregulators. You have stenohaline osmoregulators, and then you have urihaline osmoregulators. Now, we're not really going to get into discussing urihaline osmoregulators. We will discuss that more when we look at my brackish tank again, because the urihaline animals are able to withstand a wide range of salinity. In fact, that's what urihaline means, wide range of salinity. Stenohaline animals, which we humans are, uh, the freshwater fish that you're looking at, even saltwater fish, um, they are stenohaline animals. Now, it doesn't matter what the salinity is, the fact that there's a narrow range of salinity that they can live in is what makes them stenohaline. So whether you've got South American blackwater fish or you've got marine fish, they're both stenohaline animals. You cannot shift their salinity very much without them suffering. So, stenohaline osmoregulators is what we're going to talk about. You got all that? <laughs> so, your freshwater fish are stenohaline osmoregulators. They can only withstand a very narrow range of salinity, but they can actively regulate their osmotic pressure within their cells. Um, this doesn't necessarily happen um, by any sort of musculature control or anything like that. It basically still happens by the natural process of diffusion and osmosis and that sort of thing. But it's important that it can happen properly. And the amount of dissolved solids in the water have a very immediate and direct impact on how effectively an animal can do this. And um, there's probably not too many of you out there that think that a fish can die of dehydration but if you don't have your hardness right your fish can die of dehydration just like it can die from overhydration so that will be the next thing we start getting into and that will be exactly how these fish do this osmoregulation and why the water hardness is so important and I will explain what I mean when I say your fish can die of dehydration if they're not in the proper water All right, so how does a fish die from dehydration? Well, an animal's cell is not necessarily meant to be isotonic. In other words, there's not necessarily supposed to be the same amount of dissolved solids outside the cell as there is inside the cell, which is the natural balance that Mother Nature is trying to achieve. Um, the animal in a freshwater environment like this needs to have very much more dissolve solids inside of its cell than it does outside of the cell. That means the inside of the cell has a higher density of dissolved uh, solids, or in this case mineral salts, which are the fish's electrolytes. And that's why the fish needs these electrolytes in its cell. Now I don't necessarily know whether, say, a nice soft water fish um, 
needs as many electrolytes as a hard water fish does but the process of regulating how many are inside the cell versus the water outside the cell is what's important so whether they need the same amount or not whether every individual fish needs its own balance of electrolytes etc certain fish have evolved in certain conditions and fish like the fish that I tend to keep usually evolved <laughs> I guess I say dissolved evolved into softer water conditions I tend not to go for very hard water fish um, the, the reason they need to stay in soft water when they come home is because let's say you've got them in this very hard water what happens is the water they've evolved in is has a very low concentration of dissolved minerals in it and therefore their cells the semi permeable membrane has evolved to freely let water through because there's not a lot of things attached to it so their body is adapted to pass water out of the cell very freely their bodies are also adapted to collect salt out of the water through their gills um, they have certain mitochondria rich cells within their gills that actually extract the very low amount of mineral salts out of the water and basically collect them for the fish and they build them up inside the cells so that they can maintain this proper concentration so you put a fish in very soft water the water is able to move very freely through the cells and fish that are from very soft water have a lot of very dilute urine they just urinate all day long a skirt tetra will urinate i think three times its own body weight in a single given 24 hour period they're just constantly flowing water through their cells but they've evolved to do that and that's what they're meant to do so you take that soft water fish and you put it in very hard water and now there's suddenly this water that's got all of these additional ions attached to it and it cannot freely move through the cell wall into the cell because of all this attached dissolved solids so the water that is now in the cell moves out of the cell fresh water can't come in and now suddenly your very soft water fish that's in hard water is dehydrating because the cells are not replenishing the water as rapidly as they could be or should be so the reverse is what will actually happen if you take a hard water fish and you put it into very soft water it's evolved to be very stingy on letting the water in because it's used to having all of this dissolved solids in the water. Now you put it in this very soft water and there's nothing stopping this water from just flooding into its cells and suddenly you're getting cells that are beginning to rupture because the mineral salts have such a high concentration in the cell versus outside the cell. So the osmotic pressure is just incredible and the cell floods with water and the cell wall ruptures and it's not probably a very pleasant death for a hard water fish to be put in a soft water condition. Now again if you put a soft water fish into a hard water condition it's probably not very pleasant either but it's a slow dehydration and you will actually dehydrate your fish to death by putting in water that's too hard for it. So when you look at fish that are classified as beginner fish or intermediate or high skill level fish, the vast majority of the time what that is referring to is how easily it can adapt to different water conditions because I know it sounds cliche but the long and short of it is, is we are water keepers not fish keepers. The way we know we're keeping our water properly is that fish can live in it. So if you're not really good at keeping water and you don't really know about the water you're keeping or whatever, you get these fish that are fairly beginner fish and that way you don't have to know a lot about what's going on with your water and your fish will still live in it and you can sort of keep water as a beginner. The more you learn about your water, the more you understand what's going on with it and how to manipulate it, how to make it the way you want it, how you actually want it. You know, the more you learn about how it should be for the fish you have, well, now you're moving into fish that have much narrower ranges and less room for error and less room for, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And that's why these fish are not necessarily considered beginner fish. Now, there are some other reasons. Sometimes it's the diet. Uh, sometimes it's how aggressive they are or something like that that might take them out of the realm of being a beginner fish. But normally beginner fish are thought of as beginner fish for that reason. They can withstand a fairly wide bouncing around 
you know, range of hardnesses and things like that, and most people just kind of can go with it. Honestly, the vast majority of the fish I have are like that. Um, I do have very versatile water, but fish still need to adapt to it. That's why I check my water when I bring fish home from the store. I look at things like the water hardness to see if it's a lot harder than my water, my fish might have to adapt to that a little bit. And despite contrary, you know, contrary to popular belief, uh, you know, 20 minutes of dripping a fish does not acclimate a fish to different water conditions. It might get your fish used to the flavor of your water and so on and so forth. But if you have a fish that really actually needs to shift its physiology to adapt to different water conditions, that can take anywhere from days to weeks to months, depending on the fish, depending on how far it has to adapt. So that is why your water conditions and your water hardness is so important. It is 100% completely responsible for how well your fish can osmoregulate. Now the fish you have, again, if it's a gourami that can go from very soft water to very hard water and everything in between, again, that's great, but you can't take it out of very hard water and slap it into very soft water overnight without probably losing the fish. You would have to adjust that very slowly. Anytime you bring an animal down, it is always longer and slower and more stressful for the fish than taking it up. That goes for temperature, that goes for pH, that goes for hardness, that goes for alkalinity. Um, it's, al it's always easier to shift the fish up a little bit than it is to shift them down. So if you do bring your fish home and it's in water that's five or six degrees harder than your water, you may want to keep it in the harder water for a little while and let it slowly adapt to your softer water. Just a thought. But that is why your fish need to be in at least reasonably close to the water that they come from. And when it says this fish is a soft water fish or this fish needs to be in hard water, take that seriously. You know, for the people out there that say, ah, oh, you can keep African cichlids in whatever kind of tap water you want, it's not necessarily true. In fact, it's not at all true. They need to be in water that has a lot of dissolved solids in it. It's got a lot more to do than simply having the electrolytes available for them because my very soft water fish get the electrolytes they need too. It's just how they maintain those electrolytes within their cells and the hardness of the water is what is responsible for that. So it's not you know, something to be taken lightly. Take your water hardness very seriously. Seriously, It's very important for your fish. So thanks again for watching all of this. I hope that made some more sense. Feel free to ask any questions, leave any comments, uh, critiques, anything you feel like. Uh, if you're not already subscribed, please do so. That way you won't miss anything I got coming up. I got lots of good stuff coming up here in the future. So I thank you for watching this one, and I look forward to seeing you in the future on the next one.